Welcome everyone to the third talk in our series um, of Exile Talks and this follows on very nicely uh, from the talks that we've had so far. No, sorry, this is the fourth, not the third, the fourth. Gosh. Um, so, Jules, where are you Jules? Oh, there you are. I heard Jules speak first at a Quaker conference on the climate and it was such a really interesting talk about food security um, that we all thought that this would be a great opportunity um, to have people who are really interested in local growing and food and what we should be doing and today Peter who's here and I were on a Zoom all day with the Centre for Alternative Technology and their Zero Carbon Britain and food and how we grow it and how we can become more self-sufficient is absolutely central. So this is a really important topic, especially post-Brexit, post um, when everything is going to start changing in agricultural subsidies and with climate change. It's probably the number one topic. So it's great to have you here, Jules. And I know everyone's going to really enjoy your presentation and learn about the amazing work that she and Bob are doing because it's extraordinary. Really. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, um, it was Bob that gave the talk at the Quakers. Um, that was quite a while back now. Um, so uh, I'm, for anybody who doesn't know, I'm Jules Wagstaff. Um, and I'm a volunteer and trustee for Climate and Community. So Climate and Community is uh, a registered charity and we've, we've set up since uh, 2017 um, and we, the objects are educational and environmental. So our main focus really as a charity is to do something about a practical response, if you like, to uh, climate change and we've been working actually on action on climate change projects for over 20 years now uh, mainly land-based we set off in um, uh, 1994 left the city looking for alternative communities and found uh, a housing cooperative in West Wales and we joined that and then another one and we lived in a yurt because we made our first year by then and started to teach ourselves traditional rural skills and to learn about farming history and uh, took on a, a, a woodland in Kilgarran and started a, a, a charity there and start up a traditional rural skills school. So um, we've had a bit of experience uh, for a while in this We've also been involved in um, frontline campaigning. So we got involved with the climate camps, uh, the kind of, huh, it was the, the way before Extinction Rebellion um, that uh, climate camp, and we we're involved in the gatherings and organizing, and we turned up with yurts and military shelters and various other things to provide workshop space as well as giving our own workshops, giving workshop uh, space to other people and to uh, provide a cinema space. So we showed a lot of not only mainstream films, but also um, small independent filmmakers who were more often than not making films about various sort of protests or campaigns that were going on. And that was also very uh, helpful for sort of developing a network of, of, of people doing all sorts of interesting things around the UK and further afield. So, um, so we've, we've been at this for a while. So we looked, started visiting um, Ed Reville, um, who in Merton has been involved in uh, carbon negative uh, horticulture for quite a few years. And he pioneered uh, various techniques that we were intrigued by. So we kept on visiting him and helping him and um, learning about his growing system. And that's why we, we, we've 
sort of ended up in, in sort of Merton in, in the Gower because, because of that connection. In terms of sort of uh, meaning of in activism, um, you know, as I said, we came from the, the direct campaigning, but we kind of evolved into putting most of our time now into sort of pr practical, practical projects, because I feel that um, the meaning of activism is, is, is wider than just frontline campaigning. Um, I mean, in the end, we've got to sort of get out there and get involved with practical projects that actually start um, creating the change that we want to see. Um, and the other thing that I think is really important is, is to be aware of that, of the inner journey of the activist um, that um, is changing from the inside. And um, for me, that's, that's Dharma. You know, um, I'm, I'm doing this for, for, for it's a Dharma project. Um, and I know that Extinction Rebellion are very strong on um, cultivating regenerative uh, culture. And I believe that is sort of closely related um, to having that inner journey and, um, and um, looking at your sort of belief system and what, what you actually, uh, why you're actually doing it. You know, you are what you do, what you believe in, and that, that that's that's a, a very what strong. You what, you what you do is what you believe in. Bob says. So, uh, why why carbon negative food growing? Why why do it? Well, um, our own uh, government research um, publishes the climate risk assessment every five years. So the last one was in 2017. You can download it on the uh, from the web. And um, what it has to do is it's obliged to actually tell you what the climate risks, emerging climate risks are. And um, and so uh, the the most alarming climate risk really in in that publication, which is uh, not very well highlighted to be to be honest is the um is the is the issue around the uh, the degradation of a uh, high grade agricultural land and um due to the increasing soil aridity uh, reduced water availability for irrigation and depletion of soil organic matter and sea level rise doesn't help either so what it's telling us is that is that um, the the best land grade one to three in the next thirty years with what we put already put up in the atmosphere is going to drop from thirty seven percent to nine percent, and obviously you don't get caught up in exact figures because it's the trend. Um, we talk to um, is it Ian, Dr. Ian Brown, the, um, the, the lecturer who was actually involved in that research. And what he said was, yes, it actually still stands. It, it, this is a, a very serious trend. And it's going to hit the, the southeast and eastern Scotland uh, growing areas the hardest. And that is where we grow uh, most of our cereals and potato crops are our sort of staple crops and that kind of drop is going to have a massive effect on um, food availability in the UK and I think most people no, most no. most ordinary people it doesn't matter Bob doesn't no, matter. it's in the yeah. evidence report it's not in that one right okay um <laughs> right so what was I saying? Yes. Also, the other thing to think about is that we rely on 40% imports. Um, so we're going to be affected by uh, the reduced ability to grow our own food. But also we are going to be unable to import 
the food that we're importing now that subsidizes uh, um, the, the food being eaten because the uh, all the issues that we are facing will be faced by the rest of the world so this is this is devastating i mean this is incredibly worrying and it's worrying because it's actually not being highlighted or told to the um to the ordinary person so what do we need to do in swansea well what we did was we uh wrote a report um for the uh the council and just highlighted the immediate risks and gave them some uh, proposals of what they could do in response one of them was popular education um, because we believe that uh, you know yeah ordinary people are not being told in a way that they can understand and if you don't tell people what the real situation is all they do is when the shit really starts hitting uh, uh, the uh, what happens is is they look for people to blame and um, people get angry and when people go short of food then trouble starts and that's not a place where we, we, we want to be. So a popular education um, program we, we, we suggested. Um, the other part is to concentrate also on youth empowerment, looking at reskilling the young um, in the uh, well, I mean, I, I would describe it as survival skills. Certainly, you know, food growing, knowing how to grow your own food is survival skills. Um, we need to reskill, we need to retrain. I mean, the trans transition movement a few years back described it as the great reskilling. And yes, to change behavior, we need to reskill and re educate. And um, that's a massive project, you know, that, that's a massive uh, thing to do. And uh, the third part is to really concentrate and highlight um, the importance and establish localised food production, especially in the, the rural urban fringe, because what people don't really understand now we rely on this sort of globalized uh, um, the globalized world where we import food from from all over the place um in actual fact not many years ago barely 50 years ago we relied on very sort of localized food systems you know we had our market towns that would have um market gardens that would regularly deliver food in to the city centre or the market town and um, it was a very localised uh, and resilient system and it worked very well uh, and this has over the years been dismantled for example Merton had 20 plus uh, market gardens in the area and these all supplied Swansea and now there are, well, there's Kaitan, uh, which is a bit further up, but the, um, there are very, well, there aren't any market gardens in Merton anymore, not in that way. So that's very, very worrying and something that we, uh, as activists, that is something that's very tangible and real that we can get involved in. And it's great that people have started to get an interest in food growing, especially in their gardens. And um, that can supplement um, your sort of your staple needs. But what we actually need to do is expand the food growing massively and uh, in, increase the, the, the skills that people have to, to grow their own food. So... Um, the project in um, the charity in 2018, um, we spent about 18 months on Ed Reveal's uh, place in Merton, le learning sort of carbon negative horticulture. 
Um, and then we started looking in the community and seeing what we could do. So we, uh, we noticed that there was a hedge to lay. So we offered to lay a, a hedge around the recreation ground in, um, in Bishopston. And uh, so each year we started to lay the hedge. So that's where we started. And then on the opposite side of the road, there is like a, a scrub woodland and um, called Mansell Green, which is common land, but it's owned by the community council. So we started to uh, work on there and we wrote a tree survey for the community council and um, suggested some proposals for example to create a, a coppice on half of the green and a woodland pasture on the other half and the idea was to create local resources for the community in the face of climate change and we began that, but that's an ongoing project. So in May, we um, signed a lease for the field and the, and the wood, and we had 10 year lease on this. And the, um, the idea for this project that we've already started um, is, First to have about an acre of no dig um, horticulture, which is using an alley cropping system where you create long beds with a wood chip substrate. So you put about sort of 50 centimetres or so of wood chip on your beds as a, as a mulch. And um, this starts to create a um, well a, a sort of dark soil and in that dark soil you start encouraging um, mycorrhizal uh, fungal association a mycorrhizal fungi and basically they love wood chip <laughs> um, but the mycorrhizal um, association we've been aware of it and it's 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 been going on for billions of years it's the the fungus has a, a relationship with um plant roots and feeds it various nutrients that the plant can't necessarily get with its own roots and the plant in return because it's what's called a symbiotic relationship um feeds the the, the, the fungus with uh, sugars and um, you get a, a, an incredibly um, rich soil which is capable of producing very nutrient dense vegetables and this is what we've seen at Ed's over the years that um, he, he's produced inc incredible very good quality organic vegetables. Now this system doesn't rely on artificial fertilizers or pesticides and it doesn't even rely on animal manures because it isn't there are a lot of no dig systems um there's a lot of different systems that people do um some of them rely on animal manures to create the raised no dig beds uh, but this doesn't rely on that it's it's wood chip so what you do is you feed it with uh, grass cuttings and um, biochar as a sort of top dressing and that's what feeds the soil so if you are running this system what you need is you need a supply of wood chip and a supply of grass cuttings and a supply of biochar. So uh, the other part of the project is to um, get back into uh, rotation and to create coppice and reinstate coppice management. 
So if you don't know what coppice is, coppice is quite an ancient system that had its heyday in medieval times before we uh, discovered big time fossil fuels and each community or area relied on um, a wood supply uh, not only for burning but also for making things you know, uh, woodland crafts and and various useful things that that local people got out of the woods and what they found was that the um, the coppice management system was the most efficient it, it also, by the way, is a very efficient um, way of drawing down carbon because you cut it in rotation. For example, hazel, you cut every seven years and that new growth takes, takes up a lot of, takes out a lot of carbon from the atmosphere. So it actually is very good at drawing down carbon. So it has lots of benefits. And if you run it as a, a coppice with standard, you're also growing uh, timber trees that after so many years can also be uh, harvested. So from that system, you can use the coppice tailings, which is usually a waste product, and uh, wood chip them and feed that into your growing system. Part of it can be set aside and dried and then you can put them in what's called gasifying stoves which will create the biochar which is also another way of drawing down carbon and you can add biochar to soils well uh, yeah up to 20 tons an acre um, and and yeah and it will be stabilized for a thousand years or more which is incredible really um, and we could over many thousands of acres that would that would have a significant effect and you would be growing food in the process as well but you see with any of these systems the other part of the puzzle is people and the reskilling of people how do we change people's behavior how do we uh, get them interested uh, in, in land-based skills and, and be involved in doing the hard work involved in, 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 in processing this? Um, at the moment, because of our, the way our economy is kind of rigged with fossil fuels, you know, th this is very marginal. So we're not actually looking at a kind of conventional uh, green business at the moment it, it will become more and more economic because of the way the climate is changing and, and uh, as Sue said you know the, the, this the food issue is begin, gonna just become bigger and bigger and bigger uh, but at the beginning um, no no it, it's, it's not really it's not economic so the third part of the project is running a portable skill school and um, we're basing that on um, the uh, Civilian Conservation Corps, which was uh, a project set up by Roosevelt in, um, the, in 1933. And it was part of the New Deal, which uh, it was in actual fact, one of the most popular programs of the New Deal. And millions of young people were set up in camps and they were what they did was emergency conservation work because america was experiencing a great deal of environmental degradation deforestation soil erosion the dust bowl um, and there was also a depression so there was a great need to take young people out of their context and rehouse them in sort of national parks in all sorts of areas all around america in all the states every state had their camps to uh, reskill young people and we found that this project this um, um was very inspiring really for what what's going on now so 
the whole idea of the portable skills school is that we we run camps that we actually run camps for young people that will reskill them and uh, the, you, the 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 breadth of skills that you can actually offer a young person in this is incredible because you mean you've got the craft skills the craft skills that you you've got all the 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 coppice wood and the green woodworking and the the, the basketry willow because i'm a basket maker i've got an interest in that um but you've got all the craft skills and then you've got the conservation skills which is the woodland management um, and there are many other conservation skills that they could learn you've got the food growing skills um, and also the camp craft skills which involve people living and working together eating together building trust building affinity which is another big issue um, at the moment is that you know yeah we need to get on with each other and cooperate and collaborate and um, uh, be less individualistic and um, less competitive because our society the, uh, is, is um, we delude ourselves if we think that we're not caught up in this kind of competitive individualistic bubble which does not help us at all in um in in working towards changing and doing something about this massive problem if you won't go back to the last kind of crisis for example say the the second world war you know we were more collaborative we were more cooperative because we had to be and we've got to relearn that and this uh project is a great example of where we can um it's also a great example of a, of a what's called a kind of a circular economy it, it's it's circular in, in sort of permacultural terms and holistic so each the food growing the coppice management and the um and the sort of the people skills are all connected they all sort of uh, work with each other they all support each other supplement each other and uh so yes that that's that that's what we are we are doing um it's early days on the field uh, we've started to take on volunteers and people come um, on a day basis and we have uh, work weekends where people come and camp as well we, we're sort of slowly working towards um a more organized camp where we could have say a camp of say 20 young young people that would be a little bit more intense and uh, uh, we'd have to have such sort of a timetable of events and, and structured learning we're working on that at the moment um but we we taking it at one step at a time because we're very very conscious that this predominantly is a people process and you have to take time for it to grow uh, its people as well as you know your vegetables and your perennials and everything else um, the people side is is is, uh, is absolutely priority to get right because you can drive projects with money as as we have found you can drive projects with money you can get big grants but if you don't build the constituency the group of people that are going to carry this on and uh, you know i'm a volunteer and it will rely on a lot of volunteers of people doing it just because they they believe it's the right thing to do um if you don't grow that that constituency when the money runs out then the project ends and we can't afford to do that um we we, we have to um we have to work like you know damn hard to um to to get something that will actually work because this is a very serious situation so if anybody is interested in visiting then you can contact me and i'll tell you what we're doing and you'd be very welcome and uh you can have another look if if there are any other um details of what i've just said you'd like to learn more we've got the website uh, climate and community.org.uk and there is a page on carbon negative 
um, horticulture and on the uh, about us there's a bit more about the climate uh, conservation core the civilian conservation core and so there's there's more detail that you can you can find out um, and you can visit and I would recommend that that you actually visit us and see see what's going on okay Thank you, Jules. That was really interesting. Um, so far in the chat is a question from Chris, who said, where can we see the report that you gave to Swansea Council? The, uh, the Swansea report, you can go on the website and there is a page that says Swansea report and you can download it from the website. If you have difficulty with that, I can, um, if you send your email, then I can send it to you directly. The question in our group is, soil is so important, like you were saying at the beginning, it's not a very sexy subject, like pandas and polar bears. Um, how do we make people really care about soil? <laughs> food and I think people do get really uh, enthusiastic about food in various shapes and forms I, I've seen I've seen people get really interested in um, biochar I mean because uh, because aired over the years has gone to a lot of festivals um, and done a lot of talks because I you know I've, I've, I've gone along to some of them um, with him and there have always been people who are they find it very empowering it can be very very empowering to be able to uh, grow your own food and especially in the urban environment not be reliant on sort of any kind of animal manures or anything like that you know i mean some you know sometimes you can get wood chip because you can get it from um uh, you know uh, sort of tree surgeons and all that sort of thing so and people also like making biochar which is a soil amendment so I think there are there are sort of areas for people to get enthusiastic and sort of uh, well yeah they can get sexy about it as well <laughs> um, you know yeah there are and food you know it, it's it is something people do get enthusiastic about. Hey Peter, you have a question. What could we be doing in gardens around Fondi? Um, God, what your own private? If you if you're talking about your own private garden, your, I mean, well, I mean, carry on growing, carry on learning how it works. Um, uh, have an experiment with with using YouTube. Um, see see how it works for yourself. Um put in a bit of biochar, see the, the, the transformation of, of your soil, you can get a lot more um, vegetables out of a no-dig system because if you grow the depth of the soil, you can grow your vegetables a lot closer together. Would, would it be better <coughs> for you if we came to visit as a group rather than usually? Yes, because we thought several of us want to visit and you'll be repeating yourself. And if we came as a group, you could do a, a sort of tour and a one-off. Uh, uh, well, we're quite happy. I, we, did, we did a tour um, to a bunch of volunteers in, you know, about a week or two weeks ago. I don't mind either. I mean, if people want to come and visit, that's great on their own. If you want to organise a group of you to come, that would also be good. There you go then. Okay. Um, the, the other two questions is slugs. Uh, what about slugs? Have you solved the problem? Does wood chip, is wood chip more hated by slugs than all the other things that somehow or other they seem to achieve and get round and manage? No, you still have issues with slugs um, and you, I mean, you have advantages that when you put, you set off plants in a polytunnel and you put in 
like small plants into the wood chip that that seems to work best so you've got a a, a chance to get them going rather than just from really tiny seedlings but no you you still have problems with slugs and um you know you have to deal with them in this in the in the sort of same old way and um some years are worse than others so sorry there's there's no way around um slugs that's okay and the other thing that our group talked about was swansea city council has got loads and loads and loads of pieces of land that they're just sitting on um and we wondered if we could or you could or somebody could negotiate to enable us to use some of them for growing as community growing areas there are hundreds of them all over Swansea. Well, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, and and it, and the more you look, more the more you find, and it's just about asking questions in the council to uh, negotiate. I mean, they like to have some kind of organisation. Um, there is. Um, have you ever heard of uh, Neil Barry? I think it's Neil Barry, who he his job is to help groups get um get growing in in green spaces around swansea and um he recently i directed him to a friend who was it was quite a small green space in the uplands and uh, he helped to all the paperwork of getting a proper constituted group and i would probably suggest that that's that's what you do because if it's the council they tend to like some kind of constituted organization um to work with and then of course you are able to apply for grants if you need them so does he work for an organization neil barry uh yes and off the top of my head i can't remember exact the exact title he always turns up at the um environment uh, uh the environment fair in the um the green fair waterfront museum yeah the green fair I've I can give details. I've got, I have got his details somewhere and I can find them, maybe email them to you. That would be great. Thank you. Can you just put something in the uh, chat on that? Yeah, lovely. Th they um, were my questions. Thank you. Thanks, Pauline. Jessie? Yes, I, I actually know very little about biochar, so um, I'd be very keen to be putting that on my little veg plot that's out the front of my garden. The, the best way really i mean you can buy some very expensive biochar in bags and stuff but but it is just charcoal um and the best way is to make it yourself <laughs> i just need to learn that skill just need to uh is, is, is there a, is there a is there a group in swansea like is there a workshop we could go to for that sort of thing well we could start one um i mean Ed has these uh, gasifying stoves. I mean, Ed, Ed, has, Ed Reville has, has, has spent a lot of time um, experimenting with various gasifying stoves, which you can cook on. And they're great and all, but um, you don't necessarily have to have one of those. But you can make, you can make charcoal in <coughs> gallon drums, you know. I used to do that in, in the Woodland Project before. Uh, so, if you looked on YouTube uh, about how, how to make biochar small scale, you would have lots and lots of YouTube videos that you could follow and get some ideas from. Judy? Um, if you're going to get wood chips and, and you've got a raised bed already and put, put the wood chips on the top, how long do you have to wait before you can sow seeds in it? Right, so the initially there is a little bit of nitrogen robbery. So I would say about uh, three years, it really starts getting going. But in year two, you are still going to be able to get something out of it. Um, but it will take off after the third year. Um, and, but what you find is, is that uh, in that second year, you can still put, you know, um, uh, plants that you've uh, grown in the polytunnel that have got to a, a sort of certain size and you can plant them straight in. Um, but you've got to make sure that you just go so it gets to the soil. Sorry, you've got to make sure what? 
or what they actually put into soil rather than pure wood yeah. chip, the, you got the wood chip at the top and then it yeah. will be um gradually sort of uh, um composting the further down you get so you just yeah. have to sort of make sure that it goes more into the soil rather than into the uh, upper layer of the wood chip all oh, right oh great thanks uh hey sir uh yeah a bit, a bit dystopian this one but um do you think it will take an ecological crisis of some kind to really wake people up to the importance of food security a little like in china or siberia uh siberia right now if so what do you <coughs> think Sorry. what do you think that crisis might look like here in swansea what will it look like in swansea well like anything it, it's it's not it's not like a, a, a stop start situation it, it's it's gradual isn't it food prices start to increase and um and it's usually sort of like the poorer that then um suffer at first because the richer can pay for more expensive food so you you'll definitely see um poorer people suffering the, the, the greatest and if you look for example in other parts of the world where they're already having crop failure then yeah you you see that it is the poorest that suffer the most and then you will see migrations where people start moving out from the areas that uh that they can't grow grow food anymore um in this country, we're going to see the southeast of the country drying up. So you are going to get a more, I would say you're going to have England getting more and more assertive about maybe accessing the uh, water resources of, say, the west of the country. And so Wales look out, you know, we, we are... The, in, during my degree many moons ago, we talked about this kind of uh, national sort of grid of water and uh, it, it was, they thought that that would be a good idea and in the end it was sort of shelved and, uh, and, and it, it didn't happen. But you can imagine that actually um, the, the South East is, is more affluent or at the moment and it has a greater density of population and yeah it, it will it will need water that it just doesn't have and um there, there will be pressures that um wales might be pressured to give up more of its water resources and maybe we've got to think about whether we want to do that or not and we're going to have to grow more food in the west and maybe help our sort of uh southeastern friends uh, uh, a bit more because of, of, the, of the crop failures. Thanks. Sorry, I keep muting because of my puppy is going mental tonight. Zoe, you're next. Where is she? There she is. Hi. Uh, I was just saying that we are, I work for the National Waterfront Museum on the Graft Garden community growing space. And we've got a cob oven there, and I wondered if we would be able to make biochar in the cob oven. And if you might be interested in coming to teach us how to do it with our volunteers and anyone else that wants to come and learn. Making biochar in the oven, uh, we'd, have, we'd have to come and have a look and, and yeah. see, see what your setup is. I mean, um, th there's... <sighs> the gasifying stoves are the most sensible uh, okay. because you know the gasifying stoves if built right you can use the heat um the way commercially commercially made biochar actually has a lot of waste heat and uh, that doesn't actually make make them very green because there's a lot of lost heat and really with regards to our sort of uh, our resources we should we should be using all the heat that's produced and the clever thing about Edward Bill stoves is that you could use the heat for cooking and food processing um, so I would say the gasifying stoves are, are, are the are the way forwards 
but all over the planet, you know, um, there there are various sort of uh, systems for making. Um, uh, I was looking at the Adam retort stoves, which are, are used a lot in some of the um, uh, southern hemisphere countries, Africa, South America. Um, but uh, so there are lots of different um, uh, ways of making charcoal, uh, and I mean, yeah, at the moment, Ed stoves aren't, aren't suitable for domestic because they're not, well, in my opinion, they're not safe enough. They, 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 need, they need a bit more, um, a, a bit more work on the engineering side of it. Um, but um, the gasifying stoves are, are the way forwards, but there are lots of other ways of making biochar. So yes, we could talk to you and try and help you and point you in the right direction. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, so we come, we've come to we've come to the hour. Um, has anyone got any more questions for Jules? I think I got everybody's questions, didn't I? I could just uh, ask if, if Jules has come across the uh, Zero Carbon Britain report yet, or, or read that, and how how your work fits into that. Sue and I are currently on a two day course from the Centre of Alternative Technology there. Of course, uh, I can highly recommend it to anyone here. They, I think they run them every couple of months. But Jules, yeah, how, how does it fit into the Zero Carbon Britain strategy? I, I've read, is, it, is there a new edition? Is there a new publication, a more recent one? Yeah. Yeah, because I've read um, a one a few years back, um, but the, uh, well, yeah, I mean, the, in that report, it, it, it talks about, I, I, I never felt that it was really strong on the land based side, I must admit. Um, I, I, I think it gets um, renewable energy and sort of the energy side because CAT, you know, as, as for many years specialised in sort of renewable energies um yeah yeah I, I i feel that there's there's a there's now the heart of it now is, is the land use the new yeah. report it's right at the center is we have to repurpose all land use right. and yeah. it's about um a reduction in um uh, sort of uh, dairy and meat rearing and putting more over to, um, well, woodlands was, was a good part of it, um, as well as more sort of um, sort of horticulture, which seemed to make sense to me. Um, yeah, 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 sensible. But um, I, yeah, I mean, it, I think more emphasis needs to be put on the grassroots element that we can't rely on government to change the agricultural policy we do, we have to get on with it ourselves, yeah. and um, and um, pressurise them that way then to be more sensible. But we we can't just wait for the government to change, or it's just not going to happen. Do you do any work directly with schools, Jules? Schools tend to work more with adults. Um, we uh i mean we in in the other project we had to open college network we we became members of open college network and then um, run a traditional rural skills program and that worked quite well but that was post 14. um so we we tend to go for post 14 because really for what we do you tend to have, need to have a good pair of shoulders and be prepared to do a bit of hard work so uh but uh, no, not really, not really. Thank you very much, Jules. That was really interesting. Thank you. Yes. Uh, it's it's uh, we set them up really to share the initiatives that are happening. You know that that are all sort of towards uh, addressing the situation with the climate crisis. So it's very apt that we should talk about this now and act on it. And I look forward to coming out and volunteering. <laughs> yeah, we look forward to seeing you. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs>
Oh, thanks very much. Thank you.